Today, a different way to make a difference. A different way to be different. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. One way to look at the topic (laughs) and what we're going to be talking about today is to understand the difference between the appearance of a thing, the, the style of a thing, or even a symptom of a problem on the one hand. So appearance, style, symptom, uh, the superficial stuff. It's not empty. It is meaningful. Sometimes it's important. Sometimes the symptom is the reason you realize there's a disease, for instance. Sometimes the appearance of things is there because of the reality of the thing. So I'm not saying these are insignificant but they are different from the reality or the substance or the cause on the other hand. And believers recognizing that, conservatives recognizing that, on the other side, liberals recognizing it, progressives recognizing it, even moderates understanding it, can transform the way we talk to each other and the impact, the influence we can actually have with each other and on the culture as a whole. And if you uh, think back uh, a while to the imitation game, you know, this thing, there was a, because there was a movie named this, if I remember correctly, people are more familiar with it than they used to be. But the Turing test is what it's called by some people, uh, designed by Alan Turing, the computer genius, you know, who invented this game to decide, uh, you know, to come to a point, a threshold at which we could recognize recognize something like artificial intelligence. That was the idea. And the idea was that if you could develop a device that could simulate human conversation uh, so that you wouldn't be able to recognize the difference, then you would be able to demonstrate that you had obtained something like artificial intelligence. And again, that's not proposing that that proves there's consciousness or the emergence of, you know, whatever, all these crazy sci-fi ideas that are out there now. But the idea that you could imitate a, a, a genuine human conversation would be the test for artificial intelligence. And that's what was called the imitation game. You'd have an observer and a couple, of, you'd have an individual and then a computer or some kind of machine that was imitating, and and the observer would ask a question, and he would look at the responses without being able to see the participants. He would look at the responses and try to see if he could tell. Oh, that's the human. Oh, that's the machine. And if he couldn't tell the difference, then it was a, a successful imitation or a successful obtainment of what would be known as artificial intelligence. Again, not the crazy sci-fi stuff. Now, but if you, you know, if you go far enough, you do finally realize that there's no person behind the conversation, and that's how you could tell the difference. By the way, there is a different problem that's actually pertinent to the discussion I'm having today, but we will not have time to get into it, I have no doubt about it, uh, called the imposter syndrome, where people who really are qualified to participate, who, who are qualified to lead, for, this happens with professors a lot, uh, when they're new in their role, a genuine person can feel inadequate in a given context, like they are impersonating someone who's actually qualified when they're not. And that, and that also, ha- it actually happens, I think, for the same reason, because instead of just being who they are, which is an expert who's competent in teaching this discipline, they're trying to be someone else that they think is qualified, and they're not that person, so they feel like an imposter. Both are serious problems. They come from different sides, but they are the same kind of issue where we're imitating the reality that we're actually called to. And the, the example that's easy for believers to recognize would be false prophets, Uh, people who are pretending to be prophets, acting like prophets, very good at imitating prophets, but really aren't. Uh, The uh, prime example in my my accounting for literature in the Old Testament especially is the one at the very end of the first book of Kings, 
uh, where Zedekiah is, along with 400 other prophets, telling Ahab that it'll be safe to go into battle in Jehoshaphat. You know, go and you'll conquer and you'll push them around. Uh, there won't be any problems whatsoever, you know, and so on. And then you'll remember the story. Well, isn't there, there's one more prophet, isn't there, Micaiah? Ah, oh, don't get Micaiah. Hey, he dim. He always gives bad news. Micaiah tells the truth on the second go round because he 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 just pretends like he's one of the false prophets for a moment. By the way, in the same way Nathan deceives David until he actually gets the point across. Micaiah plays this game with them as well. Oh, you just want to hear someone tell you you'll win? Oh yeah, you'll win. Oh come on, Micaiah, tell us the truth. They know when they're listening to false prophets. They just don't pay attention to it closely enough. Micaiah then finally says, "Oh yeah, go to battle, and then you'll come. Uh, you won't come back, but Israel will be uh, shepherdless, so to speak." And they realize that they're going to lose the battle. And by the way, Zedekiah, who was a false prophet in this whole story, I mean, pushing people around with horns, oh, here's the symbol of the great power you'll have, Zedekiah is doing. Zedekiah never even considers that he might be the one at fault, that he is in error, even though his prophecy is completely false. He is is completely misleading the king, and all he can do is rebuke Micaiah actually strike Micaiah. Oh, yeah, well, who told you? And so on. So the idea of imitating prophecy, the idea of imitating a real influence is, histo- I mean, people have done it throughout all of history. So it's not a surprise that it might happen to us as well. So what, what I want us to do is pick out a few ways that this can happen and then talk about in our culture why it's happening so profoundly and commonly. And these are different different problems, but they are very closely related. And so uh, I think the way to do that is to describe something we see as a symptom, a problem, but it's really just a symptom of a deeper problem. So we describe the symptom, what we're doing to deal with it, and then the problem that it actually ignores or in some cases creates or just leaves behind and then to understand the bigger issue behind it. Now, to do this thoroughly on any one of these topics would require the entire episode. So we're just going to glance across them and say, well, here's an example, here's an example, here's an example. And then at the end, get a look at something from Plato. Uh, Again, Plato's not prophecy. Plato's not inspired by God in the sense of an Old Testament or New Testament prophet or apostle. But he is a really smart philosopher, and he's got some things that are contemptible and rejectable, but he also has some things that are deep insights that we ought to acknowledge, and I think you'll agree with me that this one's worth acknowledging when we get to it. So examples of a symptom or pattern. So for instance, feminism. So let's take when conservatives, and we could do this from either side, but the vast, you know, I think the, 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 the vast majority of the people who listen to me are either conservative or have been conservative most of their lives. And so if, if you're not, hallelujah, I'm surprised you got through the first few sentences with me. I'm not sure I'd be able to tolerate me, but I appreciate you listening. But for the conservatives who see feminism as the problem, or in reality, as I would describe it, as a symptom of a deeper problem, when we watched, when conservatives watched, now I was a kid when a lot of this was happening, but when we watched the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, rise to prominence as a possibility of becoming uh, part of our Constitution, or when we watched the development of feminism, and feminism has a huge range from the erasure of gender and culture entirely so that you can't tell the difference between men and women and a real focus on androgyny and things like that, to equality, to, to saying there cannot be any form of of legislation or regulation or even communication that biases toward men men or women or feminine or masculine or female or male or whatever qualification you want to give to it, that you have to have equality only by completely getting rid of any kind of regulations like that, or uh, a subtler kind of feminism, or at least a gentler form of feminism in equivalence, looking for something that would provide legal equivalence even if the actual regulations might be different. For instance, regarding pregnancy. Signs in a bar, this came up as a legal dispute among feminists, signs in a bar that warned pregnant women about drinking and about fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, And this was opposed by some feminist groups, obviously not all, but by some feminist groups because it singled out women. It didn't apply to men, and so you shouldn't put a fetal alcohol syndrome warning sign in a bar. You can hear how that would be absurd to some people, 
But to other people, it's just a sign of prejudice in the culture. I'm not saying both are equally right. I'm saying there are different forms of feminism that developed during this time so that we're not just speaking in broad terms without being in some way specific about the communication. There are all kinds of feminism that emerged, and the fact that this led to all kinds of conflict is apparent, and even the range of feminist perspectives is apparent, uh, in the way Title IX has played out. You know, when it was instituted into law, it was in recognition of this cisgendered view of the universe, that there were men and there were women, and women were not being given the prerogative uh, to participate in college collegiate sports like others were, and so they needed to have access to the same kind of equipment, the same kind of opportunities that men were having in colleges and, and, and in, undergr- and in uh, high schools and things like that in the sports Uh, in sporting uh, events. And so it starts with women's identity being protected in sports, but now, and and again, I'm not not even attacking this. I'm simply pointing out the range of feminist developments that have taken place. Now, gender identity itself is in flux, even in the interpretation of Title IX, Uh, so that as some people are arguing, which which I think is a little exaggerated, but as some people argue, uh, women's sports are threatened by the idea of allowing transgender participation uh, in women's sports, and so on. Again, I'm not picking up that argument. I'm not trying to get involved in that argument right this moment, but just pointing out the range of feminist issues that have come up. And the, the reaction against all of those feminist movements has been, for example, uh, a reversion to traditional women's roles, to uh, just, you know, I, I, I remember being in a fundamentalist Baptist movement where it was important that women not wear pants. Uh, they had to wear skirts or dresses because they needed to look feminine. And uh, all of those divisions that men had short hair and women have long hair and being very precise about it uh, were a reaction to what was feared in the feminist movement and the other movements that would be associated with it. And even in theological terms, the battle of complementarian and egalitarian theology was and, and becoming part of the culture war as that complementarian, egalitarian battle. Complementarian meaning men and women have different roles, egalitarian meaning they, they, they might have exactly the same roles, you know? That, that was the reaction, was to push back and say, well, we're not going over that cliff, so our women are going to stay home and they're going to bake their own bread and they're going to, and so on. So you get the idea. Now, again, not everybody did that. There's a whole range of reactions. I'm just pointing out the gist of this observation when we saw feminism as the problem. But it completely ignored why feminism arose. It completely ignored why women began speaking out against unfair treatment, even if we disagreed with the symptom that we had to erase gender in our society we should have responded with, hey, I wonder if these women have something legitimate that they might be complaining about. Uh, When I was speaking about this with one of our professors at Criswell College, where I'm the president, Dr. Everett Berry, a theologian here, he was pointing this out and saying it's the same thing now with a lot of other issues like race, that we hear CRT and we attack CRT, but we don't stop and, and say, but I wonder why CRT developed. I wonder if there is a legitimate problem that ought to be addressed. Even if you don't choose to address it the way the critics are addressing it, you could still acknowledge that there is a problem there. And so the problem we were ignoring uh, was what it was that caused these women to speak out. So, for instance, women being treated as sexual objects. And if you say, well, not everybody treats women like sexual objects, that's true. Obviously, it's not true that everybody treats women as sexual objects. But it is true that that view of women was fostered, nurtured, protected in our society. And it's been that way for ages. All you have to do is go back and look at ads during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and see how women are portrayed. Go and look at the way, as as some people would talk about it, the Olivetti woman was talked about. It doesn't take a lot to recognize that there was a legitimate complaint for women to offer uh, for a lot of reasons. That obviously, women had unfairly obstructed, they were unfairly obstructed from creativity and productivity in the workplace or even in their own personal lives. I had a professor, my, my greatest English professor did not have a PhD because in her, a, in her day, and this was my professor, 
in she was probably in her late 40s when she was my professor. She was not allowed to get a PhD because women were not allowed into the PhD programs in English literature in her day. We're not talking about 200 years ago. We're talking about in our lifetime that women have been unfairly obstructed from being productive or creative. As a psychology professor at Texas Woman's University, when I was teaching as an adjunct up there, told me exactly the same story, that she was not allowed to pursue a PhD until late in her life, after she'd already gone through the vast majority of her career. In, in, and by the way, in Baptist life, it was a big deal when we, Criswell College, chose the best candidate as our new professor of Greek and New Testament, and it turned out that it was a woman. We're not even a church, and it was somehow a contortion for people to go through to comprehend that a woman could be the best person to teach Greek or New Testament in a, theologically, uh, a theological classroom. I, th to think that there wasn't a problem is just to have our head in the sand. Uh, go watch the Hidden Figures movie from NASA. You can figure that out on your own time. But, you know, the, and, and by the way, if you, do, if you want a more egregious example, but over a longer timeline, you know, the resistance to battering wives, and just think about the fact that there is a word for that, battering wives, the resistance to that didn't develop until the 20th century. And it took most of the century for it to become normative to say it's not okay for a husband to abuse his wife. For us even to have the idea that a husband could sexually abuse his wife was inconceivable before court cases that happened during my lifetime. And I remember the visceral reaction to that. Well, that's absurd. How could that happen? That should tell us there is a legitimate reason why feminism arose, even if you don't agree with a particular brand of feminism. I'm not asking you to become a feminist. I'm asking us to recognize that there's a difference between a symptom when it emerges and then an underlying problem, an issue that we've left behind, how we use power, for instance, in the case of how we treat women, or the thing that we can all agree on, that we ought to love our neighbor as ourselves, and lo and behold, people of the opposite gender are also our neighbors. Not complicated, even in Paul's writings in the New Testament. So, you know, dealing with feminism as an example, you get the idea that sometimes we might address the wrong problem. Uh, in the same case, and this is, this is slightly different because the symptom is a serious problem itself as well, just like some symptoms can kill you. Uh, this is a serious problem, but take the issue of abortion, uh, the pro-life movement. When we look at abortion as a symptom, it is a serious symptom of a problem in our society and culture to this day. 50 million deaths uh, because of abortion that have taken place. I've talked about this so many times. Uh, I just, you know, I, it's inconceivable to me that we have allowed this to go on and on and not addressed it more honestly, which reveals to you that there's some way in which we're not actually addressing the problem at all. We're just participating in a fight at the surface level, which keeps things where they are instead of actually changing. And if you think to yourself, oh, well, this Texas law is going to change everything. First of all, I, as I'm recording this, the Supreme Court has not ruled yet on that Texas law that you're thinking of, the heartbeat law, and then that weird enforcement mechanism that ought to make all of us uncomfortable except for the fact that we really like the heartbeat protection idea. So anyway, I have, we don't know the result of that Supreme Court ruling yet as I'm recording this, but I will tell you it doesn't change anything. I mean, I know I get the impact it might have on Roe v. Wade, just like we thought that might happen in 1992 or just like we've desired since, 1970, since 1973. But the reality is that's not the ultimate problem. What we have done is look at a very serious symptom, which is itself a very serious problem, the deaths of these children, and try through legislation and lawsuits and around-the-corner regulations, and you have to have admitting privileges if you're going to have a clinic, and everything else to slow down or stop the abortions that are happening. And the problem that's left 
No matter what we do and no matter what the Supreme Court rules and no matter how that ruling affects Roe v. Wade, the problem that's left is still a country filled with men and women who believe that the best response to having an unexpected child is to eliminate it. We still have that. They are not going to disappear because we get a piece of legislation passed. And if you say it doesn't matter whether they disappear or not, then you don't understand democracy because the regulation, the law will change to comport with what the majority of people believe or want, which tells you where I'm going with this. We have to have an influence on the minds and hearts of people. I'm not saying not to have a legislative influence. I'm still for that too. But if we're not at the same time winning over the hearts and minds of people who can then live according to this new understanding of the value that we give to human life and why we protect it and how we'll provide for those who are affected by that kind of law or that kind of restriction, then it's never going to change for good. And nothing changes for good in a fallen world, obviously, but for the long term where it's not just again part of the culture war, where we're screaming from our side of the cliff and you're screaming from your side of the cliff and the the valley between, the gulf between is just filling up with the corpses of those who are victims of that culture war. It is time to do better. And so we should recognize the bigger issues. And from from the side of those who are conservative and think about this issue, you know, it's, it's men acknowledging and recognizing that if we have treated women as if their only value is either as a sexual object or a nursery, that that's not good enough, that that that's not what women are. Uh, For men and women both to recognize that uh, sexual activity is not just a recreational activity with some dangers, you know, some side effects, STDs or pregnancy, instead of recognizing it as a means of expressing your deepest and self-sacrificing commitment to another person, that it's actually that connection between people. Uh, And also, by the way, recognizing in our culture this this problem that we leave behind, which is that we, we just act as if children emerge from nothing, not that they are the product of God's intentional involvement in creating life and giving it a purpose and recognizing those things can help change a person's perspective on an issue like abortion. I'm not just saying, hey, we have to get all the the people who are not pro-life to be pro-life, but I am saying ignoring that, ignoring the values in our own selves that are being undermined by some of the ways we've belligerently participated in the culture war as if pro-life means anti-abortion, Uh, is not helping with the long-term solution or with the long-term safety of those very children we say we care about. And what we should agree on, by by the way, on this one is fairly basic, that every life is of equal worth. Even if others won't acknowledge conception, we can certainly acknowledge that at some point in the womb, there's a life there to be dealt with. Even Roe v. Wade has to deal with that idea that, that that's there. I want, you know, protection all the way back to conception, but acknowledging that there is a life there at some point that needs to be protected can be helpful. We haven't engaged in that because we're pretending like it's all or nothing. We we either obliterate the enemy or we've accomplished nothing. And by doing that, all we're doing is entrenching ourselves on those two sides of the cliff I was just describing a moment ago. Reproductive values and rights are another point of agreement. They are fundamental to human dignity, and we know that. It's why there's a conservative insistence on protecting the unborn because of the importance we know goes with the life that God gives in the womb and fertility and all of those things and reproductive freedom. But so do the liberals. A liberal or a progressive person's insistence on protecting reproductive freedom, you know, both to have and not to have, be forced to have children. If you want to have children, you have it. If you don't want to have children, you're not forced to have children. That desire for protecting reproductive rights is connected to our understanding of how important a facet of human life the value of reproduction is and the relationship that people have in that context. And and we should find some ground there where we can build protections for everybody who's involved in that. 
You know, a third example, I was giving feminism abortion, a third example, secularization. You know, our culture is becoming the secular haven. I would say more likely a de-Christianizing of it or the rise of this anti-Christian movement, meaning uh, anti-Christian power, those who oppose the way Christians have used power in the past. And, and the reason I choose that language about secularization, you'll see uh, just, you know, simple examples of the symptoms where we look at it and say, well, this is where society's gone south. They've, they've just gone crazy. There's no prayer in schools. God's been kicked out of schools, as if those two are equivalent statements, by the way. No state written, state sponsored prayers is not the same as kicking God out of the schools. We should know that, but we don't because we choose to stand instead on the other side of the cliff and yell at the other side, uh, red faced and irrationally. But we in 1962 63 look at it as if somehow God's been excluded from schools because the schools don't write and sponsor the prayers that are spoken by students, whether they mean them or not. Yeah, you can tell where I stand on that particular issue, admittedly. The same thing, though, with the LGBTQ plus agenda making progress in the way that it is. And by the way, well, I'm not even going to go there. So I'll just pause and say, if you want to, if you want to consider why a person as hostile, as anti-Christian even, and I'm not saying he attacks Christianity, I don't have any idea. But if you want to know why a voice like Dave Chappelle's voice is more prominent in response to the LGBTQ plus movement than any preacher you know, then you should consider the things I'm talking about today. There's a reason that Christians are being marginalized in our communication, and other people are somehow being given this not fully sympathetic, but partially sympathetic ear on exactly the same kinds of issues. It's an interesting conundrum for a different discussion, one I don't have time to get into right now, but I can guarantee it's not Dave Chappelle's fault. Uh, it is something we should be looking at in ourselves. How hostile must we appear to the culture? And we're here, we're, here we are, we're supposed to be peace, we're supposed to be representing the good news of God, the love of God, and peacemaking. And instead, we've become these participate, participants in the culture war, in the battle for society, and boy, we can do better. So, you know, there are all kinds of problems that's going to lead to the LGBTQ plus agenda for organizations like mine, Criswell College, and I think there are some legitimate issues we ought to acknowledge. Uh, abuses of the LGBTQ plus demographic, the, the population, historically are part of, part of what's led to where we are right now. But the problems it's going to lead to for religious liberty are also serious. Uh, and I don't have time to run through this in detail, but I will say, you know, in 2010, when we had the elimination of federal guaranteed loan program, you think this is unrelated, but it's related directly when we eliminated the possibility for private organizations to give loans to students to go to school with the guarantee of the federal government. That's the federal guaranteed loan program. When that was eliminated in 2010, and then LGBTQ plus status ends up being added in some ways, and this is in progress, but ultimately it's gonna happen uh, as a protected status, meaning the same kind of protection that you would offer uh, in civil rights for race, for instance, then there becomes a threat to organizations like Criswell College, where we're training ministry students who have to agree in some way and have to agree with our student manual, but our faculty and others have to agree with our doctrinal statements that include this commitment to traditional marriage and so on. And the, the threat comes in the form of students who want to attend a college to prepare for ministry, not being allowed to receive grants or loans made available to students who are pursuing anything else. And suddenly religious liberty is not quite as free as it used to be. And the same thing uh, is a possibility with the Fair Housing Act for colleges who provide uh, residents, which Kurtzwell College does now, and so we have to deal with that as well. Uh, the other thing that joins this, and by the way, you see this happening in Europe right now particularly, is Muslim immigration. Immigrants uh, coming in, refugees or immigrants coming in from uh, pr predominantly Islamic areas, fleeing terrorism, by the way, fleeing terrorism, and being segregated, being... Uh, viewed as the threat to the society or culture where they're seeking refuge. And you can see that in the United States with recent attempts to separate Christian immigrants 
from Muslim immigrants. A- actually, to have a, a a religion test for a person to get into the United States, which is an absurdity if you consider religious freedom in the history of the United States, but not such an absurdity if the symptom that you've perceived is that Christianity is not as prominent as it used to be in our culture, rather than the problems that are actually left behind by seeing that as the symptom. For instance, the fact that we divide the society or the population into even starker contrasts, or the bigger problem, which is that we ought to be bringing people into a real relationship with God. When when believers see Muslim immigrants coming into the country, they should be saying, Hallelujah, I don't have to take a jet to do missions. I can just drive across the street. I can invite my neighbor into my home. I can go down to the apartment complex and and start a Bible study. And lo and behold, I'm doing missions to the very people we ought to most desire to share the gospel with. Uh, And so you get the idea. We, if we don't see the problems clearly, can actually contribute to them or contribute to their persistence. So what, what's happened is, and, and this is a big part of what's happened is, we have become more aware of how to win power, more aware of public opinion and how to wield the ballot box than we are aware of the truths for which we ought to be advocating or the truths that ought to motivate us to get people out so they want to vote for the right things or so they want to express the truths that actually matter. So, and obviously, I could describe symptoms here as election problems, and, uh, you know, we, we lose ground on the election, so we view that as losing control of the election, so we redistrict so that those minorities can't get their votes and take control of congressional seats and so on like that. The need to control the redistric- redistricting process, which, by the way, fr- happens from both sides, catastrophically, every time. Whoever's in power gerrymanders. We all know it. We all know it happens, and we all know it's unfair. And I'm just mystified that no one stands up in Congress, in a legislature at the state level, and says, you know what? Let's just take some prima facie lines based on municipalities or counties or rivers or valleys or mountains or something that's not politically weighted. And let's just draw the lines that way and then let the consequence of the election based on be based on what people actually think and whether we've actually persuaded them or not. You say, well, you just don't have a grasp on the reality of politics. No, I have a grasp on the reality of the pragmatics and utilitarianism of politics. But I have a root in the truth of what we ought to be valuing, something we've lost because we have become sophists. We have become people who, when we lose an election, decide that if we can motivate our our demographics, our population, to believe it was fraudulent, because it can't be the case that our candidate actually lost, I mean, clearly, that's not possible, then we're doing, we're promoting a fraudulent investigations into election fraud. Why? Because we accused the system of fraud. We foment the crowd to believe there was fraud. And then when we, we need to justify the investigation, say, well, look, they don't believe the elections were fair and we need to prove to them they were. That is the definition of gaslighting. That's what it is. That we would do that is not even the problem. Addressing the gaslighting isn't the problem. The problem is that we really have become sophists. And if you say, I don't know, I don't know what a sophist is, S-O-P-H-I-S-T, by the way. Let me just share with you what sophistry is about. Not sophistry in the, in the modern sort of casual rhetorical sense, always just up there blustering about things, but genuine sophistry, what sophism is historically. So when Plato describes reality, he describes a truth that underlies it. And then our job is to comport to that truth, to recognize it, to turn around and speak to people who don't want to hear it, what that real truth is. It's a cave allegory for those of you who've never heard it, and I'm not going to share that right now. But the book just before that, In the Republic, there are 10 books, and the sixth book, the seventh book has the cave allegory. The sixth book has this in it, a description that Plato's giving of the real power that politicians have in their culture, which is exactly the same as the real power that politicians are exercising 
in our culture. He says, you know, when they meet together, and this is in the words of Socrates, but it's Plato who's writing it. So when they meet together and the world sits down at an assembly, so think, think of our political rallies or conventions, or in a court of law or theater or so on, and there is a great uproar. You know, this is the red meat speech, right? And there's a great uproar, and they praise some things that are being said or done, and they blame other things, equally exaggerating both, shouting and clapping their hands. Can you see it at a political rally? Will any private training enable the person, the politician who's supposed to be leading this crowd, but in reality is just being driven by the crowd, right? So he says, will any private training enable that person, that politician, to stand firm against the overwhelming flood of popular opinion? Or will he be carried away by the stream? Will he not have the notions of good and evil which the public in general have? He'll do as they do and as they are. That is, when you're in front of that crowd and they're all cheering and yelling because you use this pejorative term about the opponent and then you go, oh, I found the truth. I know how to lead this crowd. Does that mean you're actually leading the crowd? Or have you just learned how to play with the crowd, how to, re how to respond to their, to their lead, which is say hateful things, join us in our opposition. They're not connected to some underlying and very significant truth. They're connected to their emotions. The crowd, the herd mentality is a dangerous mentality. And that we have become the kinds of people who simply play to that crowd is what, by the way, Plato's describing about his politicians. Uh, they use also the four, I wish I could go into more time on this because we could talk then about how we turn that into the use of force to get people to agree with us. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, take, your, I'll take your stuff. I'll sue you in a court of law and so on. We don't have time to get into that, but he compares it to people who train animals. I've talked about this for over a decade, uh, this great quote from Book Six in the Republic, when he says, so sophists, when they are doing their work, they do in fact teach nothing but the opinion of many. Think about how news reports and news cycles are entirely built not on some great truth, but on public opinion about some great issue. Well, 60% of the population believes that blah, blah, blah. And then it's stated as if that's that now, therefore, something we need to address. It's because we're like this sophist who can teach only the opinions of their assemblies. And this is their wisdom. That's all they have. I might compare them, Plato says, through Socrates, to a man who should study the tempers and desires of a mighty strong beast who is fed by him. He would learn how to approach and handle him also at what times and from what causes he's dangerous or the reverse. And what's the meaning of his several cries and by what sounds when he he utters them. He is soothed or infuriated. And then good, the good things, he would pronounce to be whatever the beast delights in and evil to be whatever the beast dislikes. He can give no other account of them except that the just and the noble are the necessary, having never himself seen and having no power of explaining to others the nature of either good or noble. That is, who's training whom when a lion tamer tames a lion? Is the lion taming, I mean, is the tamer really going in there and saying, I'm going to change your nature? No, that's not what happens. He observes the lion, watches the lion, and says, ooh, when I feed him this, he behaves this way. So now I know how to make the lion do something. No, you don't. The lion now knows how to make you give it a piece of red meat. You were trained by the lion, and that's what Plato is saying our politicians are doing with the crowds. We're no longer leading people to the truth. We're no longer bringing to them what they need in order to change. We're coming to them and saying, how do I become your head? How do I become your leader? Ooh, I say these words, and you are behind me. And he laments in this way, Plato does. This is thousands of years ago that we recognize this. You recognize the truth of what I've been saying, Plato says to his audience. Then let me ask you to consider further whether the world will ever be induced to believe in the existence of absolute beauty or absolute truth, or any of the other things, rather than of the many beautiful, or just everybody's opinion, or of the absolute in each kind, rather than of the many in each kind. This is Plato's way of simply saying, because we've become so focused on pleasing the crowd, winning over the crowd, paying attention to the census, getting the polls, and working with the population, we have forgotten to connect ourselves to the underlying truth we were supposed to be communicating from the beginning. The reality that changing demographics and that there's an ongoing need to convince our constituencies and our, and our changing demographics and others that there's still a truth 
worth supporting, worth believing in. For believers in Christ, there's nothing more important than that absolute truth that underlies everything. And New Testament Christianity is not just an imposed or protected religion where we get people to say the words, but they don't mean them. That's not what Christianity is in the New Testament. It is this experience of repentance and confession and transformation and becoming a new creature. And it's a truth so powerful that prisons and executions cannot even stop it or hinder it when it's going forward. That's what the book of Acts is all about. It's not, Christianity is not a religion that's hindering or stopping others with the use of force. Christianity is the religion so powerful that it cannot be stopped by force or law or regulation. For, look, for us to do it ourselves, for us to solve these problems, to address these symptoms with our own machinations is the opposite of the faith to which we're called. Believers have to start living in faith. Again, faithful to our leader, the the resurrected one, Jesus. Faithful to our leader and to his great commandment, trusting that he's the one who ultimately has the power so that we can see how God will bring about change in us and in our culture, a different way to make a difference. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.